So I'd be delighted to hear any questions for Catherine and Amy. I'll start. <laughs> I'm Karen Smith Yoshimura, um, OCLC Research. We have a working group. This is really for Amy. We have a working group of some of the partners on organizational identifiers, mm -hmm. as especially how they're represented in ISNI. Um, because it's great giving the credit where the credit's due for these authors, but the other real challenge is to have them affiliated with the correct institution, exactly. especially since they tend to change and they tend to move. So in your setup, are you putting in um, organizational identifiers, the ISNI identifiers for affiliation? Right. Um, it's, you know, this hasn't really been, um, the, the actual specifications of an implementation and other systems haven't been worked out yet. It's really so far just been at that level of, if you're going to have a contribution statement, use these terms, right? But um, I, that's, that's kind of a key part of the, the ORCID architecture as well, is association with institutional identifiers. And so, I mean, if you I think of the role as associated with the publication, the publication associated with the ORC ID, which is associated with the institutional ID. So it is part of that ecosystem. Right, and, but, yeah. and one of the things that's clear is that publishers have to be on board with these identifiers for right. it to really to work through the research life cycle. Right, yeah, I, th they do. And I think for the, you know, I think for the most part, um, they, they are. I mean, I think they recognize the importance of this and, and of, they've seen, you know, certainly with Crossref and starting with ORCID, seen this, types of additional services they can build on top of their own um, platforms with them, so. Mackenzie? Yeah. Amy, um, I have a question about the credit system and the taxonomy you're developing. You mentioned at the beginning how sad it is that we have this over-reliance on simplistic metrics like H-index. So have you guys thought much about how, once the system is deployed, the, the nuances might feed into a more sophisticated type yeah, of metric system? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, and that's part of the reason, even though you know, this project is, it's supported by digital science, it's not directly um, related to any of the current portfolio solutions, but it's definitely because we envision and we, we see the capability to create a whole new kind of metrics on the basis of this kind of information. Um, and so, I mean, there even, um, there's, a, there's a session on this topic tomorrow at the Science of Team Science meeting at NIH, and there's project credit being featured, but also some work out of, um, of Dan Katz, who's been affiliated with NSF, on something called transitive credit, where you're actually associating, you know, quantitative value with, with roles like this. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it's inevitable that once something like this is actually adopted and, and used, that there will be new types of metrics um, built on top of it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Linda Galloway from Syracuse University, and I don't know if anybody here reads The Scholarly Kitchen, but today there was a post about um, what, the, what the chefs took away from the, the Society for Scholarly Publishing meeting that was just held. And several of them mentioned that they had a panel of researchers come, and nobody, none of these researchers had any interest or knowledge of ORCID. So I wonder if this, I mean, is, is your plan to sort of, with project credit and the integration into ORCID, trying to raise awareness of that yeah. type of identifier as well? Yeah, I mean, ORCID, I, I, I still think of ORCID having been in like a soft launch phase. Um, from my perspective, and I, Mackenzie and I kind of share a view on this, there's a lot of functionality around ORCID that isn't yet created that makes it makes a lot more compelling to institutions and researchers. For example, the ability to um, auto-populate your record of scholarship, and that's that should be coming on board this year. Um, so, def I mean, we, we definitely want to be doing a lot more about creating awareness globally of ORCID, and in fact, um, ORCID re recently received a very um, large grant that's all about community outreach. So you should definitely expect in coming months and, and you know, years to be hearing a lot more from people whose job it is to um, explain the value of ORCID to institutions. But it's really been, you know, word of mouth so far. ORCID has not done much in the way of, of outreach. And, and part of it is because it's, I think it was sort of, you know, it was waiting for the right time. Um, I, you know, went 
um, when I was at Harvard, one of the things I tried to do was get ORCID implemented institution-wide, and it was very hard to make the case, even though, you know, I was so in <coughs> invested in ORCID because people didn't quite understand the value of it then. So it's, personally, I think that we need to see publishers saying, you know, it's required, and funding agencies say it's required, and then institutions who respond to, you know, risk management and compliance more than anything else, we'll get on board, so. Catherine, would you like say anything about ORCID uptake among faculty? Well, I, I think that um, there's been a lot of conversation about ORCID at UC, and I mean, I, I don't wanna speak for the system, but I think that there's a sense that this really needs to be happening at an institutional level, um, that if we leave it to the faculty to find their way to ORCID and to sign up for IDs, it's going to be a very slow process. So if we can, as an institution, um, you know, sign on and, um, and assign those IDs, that would be a much more efficient process. I was just going to, to add to that with um, some experience from our implementation of ORCID at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we had a few of our star researchers sign up for ORCID IDs and we showcased them as good examples. We then took our largest college, the College of Engineering, and ran a pilot where the Dean, the Associate Dean for Research, and the University Libraries collectively encouraged implementation of ORCID across that college and then rolled it out across the rest of the university. We are trending now at about 60 to 70 percent uptake. Uh, you can look at our library webpage to grab some of the promotional materials we developed. One of our developers also created a bit of software that has built an automatic connection between the ORCID database, our enterprise directory, and our HR system, which in turn populates our repository. So it's taken the pain out of the system, an email invitation, a single click, and it flows from there. We now have ORCID as part of the sign up for new people when they join the university, they go to the HR department to make their health benefit selections, and we encourage them to assign, um, sign up for an ORCID ID if they don't have one already, and new graduate students when they arrive on campus also are encouraged, pretty much requested or coerced into having an ORCID ID assigned. Thanks. Hello. Um, my name is Jean Molendijk from Utrecht University. Um, I have a question for, um, uh, for Catherine, uh, mostly. I, I would be very interested in your opinion on, on uh, this, uh, the, the talk of uh, Amy, the subject, about um, uh, more fine-grained uh, control of, of authorship and attribution. Um, if uh, humanities scholars are already freaking out by simply counting number of articles per year, uh, what will this do for them? <laughs> Well, I think in many ways it'll do nothing for them because they're often single authors. Um, but, uh, but, but I mean, I, I've generalized grotesquely <laughs> about the humanities here. I mean, I think that there are all kinds of new forms of humanities research where there are multiple authors. Um, and I, you know, the digital humanities, for example, where you know you have the same kinds of relationships among authors. And, and I suspect since those are new models in the humanities that, that they would be receptive to something like this. There aren't well-worn well, well, well -worn paths of, of attribution and, and rank. Um, and, and so I think this could be very positive for them as well. Any last questions? I just, just a quick comment that I, um, I have a, uh, a research point, part-time research appointment next year to focus on contributorship for humanities and social science, and so I'll be trying to think about what it means to extend the application of it into science, social science and humanities, too, so. Looks like we've got one more. Uh, thanks, Constance Smaltz, OCLC Research. Uh, I. I uh, I kind of want to harken back to, to an issue that Catherine raised uh, explicitly in, in her presentation, and Amy, you touched on uh, briefly in your overview of, of the digital science portfolio, and that's the, um, that's the funding base for scholarship in the humanities and, and the organization of funding streams in, in the humanities. Um, it seems to me that generally there's a lot of attention now to, to shifts 
in the funding base for, um, for all kinds of research. So we see attention to uh, increased reliance on uh, private funding rather than uh, public national scale science funding. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, if this enriched view of, uh, of the scholarly process and research products, in your view, do you see that as something that might shift some of the thinking about um, funding for, for work in the humanities? So, so the level of investment that we see in different sectors is sometimes predicated on a, on a presumption about the nature of the benefit, which is perhaps perverted to some extent by a traditional authorship model. So having this more enriched view of who's contributing in what fashion with what base of support, it seems to me, might give us a richer picture of what funding really looks like. So there was the National Academy did an interesting um, analysis reason, uh, recently of looking at uh, the degree to which we should be tracking nonprofit support in, in R&D. And this is largely about being able to understand the contribution of nonprofit R&D to total economic output. And there was concern about the lack of taxonomy for understanding nonprofit organizations and the positions of research contributors in nonprofit organizations. They're sort of not visible in traditional published record. Um, so it seems to me that there's, there's, a, there's potentially an interesting additional benefit here that it will give us a, a richer picture of, of scholarly production and the ways that uh, funders fit into that picture so that we're not uh, reliant on these uh, helpful but sometimes oversimplified views of, you know, here's public purse, here's private purse. Um, it just it seems to me there's, there's an interesting... Yeah. Intersection there. Yeah, you, I mean, you touched you touched on many things, and and I I mean we're we're definitely seeing um, in sort of the information science space, you know, new completely new funding bodies, you know, coming into the space. For example, I mentioned the grant to Orchid. It comes from the Helmsley Foundation. You know, I mean, who would have thought that Leona Helmsley's legacy would be to fund the Orchid system? Or, <laughs> but um, you know, and, and there are several other. Um, so I mean, I think you're. And, and I do know that when we sort of look at the relationship between, you know, publishing and institution and, and funding source, that we want to have kind of a more articulated view of type of funding. Is it a center grant? Is it an individual grant? I mean, all of, all of that. So I, I definitely see what you're getting at. It's not something that we've explicitly addressed with what we're doing. Uh, if I didn't mention it before, the contributorship work was funded by the Wellcome Trust because they were very interested in, in being able to track, you know, sort of ROI. Um, on their investment dollars in terms of, you know, not only what the publications were, but, you know, what did the people that they funded actually do with their time? I mean, what were they doing? Um, so, there, yeah, there's a whole, um, there's, a, there's a lot more kind of specification and detail that could be, could help fill in that picture. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but, yeah. I would just add, I mean, I agree with, with what Amy said, and I would add that it could be of great interest to the funders, not just those people who are, have an investment, a personal investment in the credit, or those people interpreting that investment, but for the funders to have a better understanding of, of what they're funding and, and how that manifests in publications could be a wonderful outcome as well. All right, please join with me in thanking Catherine and Amy. Thank you.